Well, welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar. Um, my name is Seamus Murphy. I'm a consultant, um, environmental consultant, focusing on climate change and carbon in agriculture and land use. I'll be speaking briefly uh, later on uh, alongside Nigel Miller, who is our main speaker this evening. And Nigel needs no introduction, but uh, I'll do my best. Nigel is a former vet who has worked in numerous different roles throughout the industry for decades. And he was the NFUS president from 2011 to 2015. He has recently been a co-chair of the Farming for 1.5 panel, uh, looking at the impacts that achieving one point, uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will have on agriculture in Scotland. And we'll hope to hear a lot about that uh, when Nigel is speaking later. So, he was doing all of this whilst also farming uh, beef and sheep in the borders. So great to have Nigel with us and we hope you'll enjoy Nigel's talk. I'm also joined by uh, Alex Perry, who's an agricultural consultant in the AIR office for SAC Consulting. And Alex will be taking questions and making sure that myself and Nigel are, are kept right throughout the night. Uh, I've been also a colleague in the background, making sure that the technology and everything ticks away all right. So we should be well covered here, um, hopefully anyway. Uh, if we have next slide, please. So this is an important, really important part of these webinars. Uh, the questions are crucial. So make sure if you have any questions regarding COP26, climate change, carbon footprint, anything like that, get your questions in, get them in early. We'll try and hit, try and answer them all at the end. If we don't answer them, we'll try and get them in the next webinar, next few webinars. This is the first of a series. So make sure if you have any questions, get them in and we'll try to do our best to answer them. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to speak to you a little bit about COP26 and give a bit of a background as to what COP26 is. So it's a United Nations Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, and the 26th is the 26th meeting. But what does that all mean? And unless you've been living under a rock for the last few months, I'm sure you'll have heard about COP26 coming to Glasgow, coming to Scotland, and how important it is. There's going to be thousands and thousands of delegates coming from all over the world that will be talking, trying to discuss climate change, trying to discuss how we're going to prevent catastrophic climate change going forward. World leaders, huge world leaders are expected to come to Scotland and it'll be the biggest, the biggest uh, UN conference this year and the biggest since the uh, previous um, NATO meetings uh, in Britain. So we'll have the next slide, please. Just to give, the, give you a background as to why these meetings are important, I thought I'd speak a little bit about how it's worked in the past. So the Montreal Protocol was an agreement reached by different members of the United Nations, different member states, to try and solve an environmental problem. Most of us won't have heard of the Montreal Protocol, but most of us will know about the ozone layer and the depletion of the ozone layer. That was the biggest environmental issue back in the 80s and 90s. The Montreal Protocol was the United Nations countries coming together to try and solve that problem. The Oslo Protocol, similarly, was looking at sulfur dioxide and emissions, transboundary emissions of sulfur, which was causing acid rain. So another huge environmental issue that both of those things are not as important anymore. Um, farmers will know that because we're talking about sulfur now as, as um, being a limiting factor in, in growth uh, because it used to be there in the atmosphere due to these emissions. And the Oslo Protocol and different protocols around that helped to solve the acid rain problem, which was great for uh, forests and fish. And now we need to start looking at sulfur again um, and start spreading that again on land. The Kyoto Protocol then was the first attempt at a climate change agreement. Um, it would be fair to say that it has not had the desired effect Hence, why we're talking about COP26 and why we have the Paris Agreement and these other things. It was the first attempt. Climate change is a lot more complex than those previous ones. Um, you've kind of got 
single sources of emissions for Montreal for the ozone, which was different kinds of chemicals. Um, and it, it was a single issue. The ozone with sulfur dioxide was mainly related to the burning of fossil fuels and the sulfur that was coming from that, burning the coal. And these are single issues, whereas, as we all know, climate change has different gases from different sources, loads of different kind of moving, moving um, parts to the climate change problem. And it takes a bit more of a nuanced approach to try and solve that. Uh, next slide, please. So the previous, the, the big agreement was reached in 2015 in Paris. And what it tried to do was limit warming to well below two degrees. And ultimately, 1.5 degrees was the goal. So that's why we have the, had the farm of 1.5, because 1.5 was that that was the number. We were supposed to limit warming to that 1.5. The most recent IPCC report that came out uh, just a few weeks ago suggests that we may have already gone above 1.5 degrees. It, it, it may be out of reach now to maintain warming to 1.5 degrees. But the Paris Agreement is still important. And this is part of the reason why Glasgow, why COP26 is so important. There was binding commitments. So if you look back to 2015, when the Paris Agreement was first um, brought in, and you think about now, how, how the, the climate change agenda, how we all talk about net zero, we all talk about carbon over the last five years, that's no accident. That came about because of the Paris Agreement. Countries had to make plans. They had to put in these plans to reduce their emissions. And now from COP26 forward, action is what's needed and countries have to start proving what is required in action so with COP26 there's all this talk about Glasgow and how, how important it is it's, it is really really important but it's unlikely that there's going to be a Glasgow agreement or something like that it's it's the next step of the Paris agreement so there may well be a, a Glasgow amendment or something like that to come out of it but whatever comes out of it it's action that countries are going to require now and that's I think in the media, in even conversations I'm having with farmers, I think everyone is kind of know, knows that now we're bought in. It's, it, we need action. We need to start really reducing emissions. And hopefully this webinar series that's going to run over the next five weeks will help to give you farmers more knowledge as to what we can do and what's needed going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, I've mentioned uh, net zero, I've mentioned all these kind of targets, but it's easy for, for us, not, not just farmers, but us as individuals to look beyond, look, look at these targets and say, oh, I have to do a carbon footprint, I have to do this, I have to do that. But there's real, real world consequences to climate change. And I just added these pictures here just so we can, we can be thinking about that. We, we, it's, it's really, really important. If we do not reduce our emissions, the consequences are catastrophic. It, it, it's, we're at the stage now where action is required and that's seen globally. Uh, every country in the world has acknowledged this. That's why there's thousands of people planning on coming to Glasgow or marching around the world. That's why Greta Thunberg is a star. That's why it's, it's all to do with this. It's all to do with the the implications of if we do nothing, it's catastrophic. Just to give you an example of the pictures on your screen there now, that's the one in the top right-hand corner is Bangladesh. And I think it's 8 million people in Bangladesh live in floodplains. And as sea levels rise, they're going to be without homes. And the, the, the political, socio-economic kind of impacts of that, it, it, it will hit here. These things are going to have an impact. They might seem far away, but I think in a COVID year, we, we can all accept that the world is small and these things will come and have an impact on us. The wildfires in Australia are down the bottom bottom left. Um, on the right, that's Lake Mead, where there's been a, um, a crippling drought in California, um, a, another kind of very kind of strong agriculture down there, and they're struggling big time. Um, you can see the black on top. That's where the water levels used to be in Lake Mead. Um, some of you might have visited Hoover Dam. And then on the top, Top left is from this year, that was 2021 in France. Uh, you might remember back in April, it was quite cold. It was quite a, quite a hard kind of front end. And um, 
there was frost got some of the vines and apparently it's had a catastrophic impact on the crop this year. That, that was an attempt by the vineyards to try and fend off the frost. So they lit candles around all the vines, basically, or, or, or what are going to call flares, um, to try and fend off the frost. So this is just this slide is just kind of to, to, to show that this is why it's such such a big event and this is why it's so important globally. The, the impacts of climate change on, on Scotland and the UK will will be will will we will feel it, but it's probably not going to be as bad as it for the people in Bangladesh or, or people in other parts of the world, but we still we still have to do our bit. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a this is kind of what it's all about, basically. This is emissions from 2016, and this is uh, our world and data. Um, it's from the World Resource Institute. So as you can see there, clear as day, energy, the consumption, the burning of fossil fuels, 73.2% of emissions. Now, I think, I think that the um, agriculture, forestry, land use, those kind of things there, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't look at energy and say, that's clearly the problem. We don't need to do anything. You know, we're we're we we we're, we still emit we're still significant emitters of greenhouse gases. Um, and as I kind of tried to get to at the start there, we all have to do our bit. Energy, they have a, they have loads of work to do. Loads of work to do in reducing the emissions um, from the burning of fossil fuels. And yes, you could say they they have the most work to do. And that the scrutiny that agriculture maybe gets is a bit unfair. I agree with that. I think that energy, energy is the is the cause of it. It's it's a big player, but agriculture emissions from agriculture, we still have to reduce, and we we have to do that. And I think we will, and I think we are going in that direction. And I think when Nigel talks about it later, it will show how we can do that and what's needed. Next slide, please. So that was global. This is national. This is Scotland in 2019. This, this slide was gotten from the uh, Climate Exchange Group in Edinburgh there. And it just shows you where agriculture is right now when we're talking about emissions. So we're the third, third biggest emitter uh, in, in Scotland. Now, it is expected that that will, that our, our share, agriculture share of emissions will increase. Um, I, I expect emissions to reduce, but our share of this Will increase as transport and business become more efficient. So we we will be doing the right thing. We will be reducing our emissions, but the scrutiny may increase because we might may become the the largest share of emissions. So it's just something to be aware of. It's something that we need to kind of be thinking about, and it's an, another reason that we have to put our best foot forward. And we have to really the job, my job, um, the job of NFUS, the job of other kind of industry. Um, organizations is to make sure that that if as as these other industries reduce their emissions, the reason why agriculture can't do it as 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 um, quickly as these other industries, we have to. That's our job to get that across and put that across. So next slide, please. And this is ultimately why we can't reduce our emissions as, as easily as some of these other industries. And it's down to the fact that it's biological processes that is, are the main sources of emissions in agriculture. So if you look here, uh, dairy, beef, sheep, uh, sucker beef, they're the main emissions. It's down to enteric methane, down to ultimately livestock, Chewing the cud, burping back up, methane. That's where the 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 big big the biggest problem is in livestock. In arable, there's a huge issue with nitrogen and nitrogen emissions um, from nitrogen fertilizers. So they're kind of the sources of emissions. To say that um, to say kind of that it's it's all a livestock problem it isn't right either. We we all have to do our bit, and I know that it, as as arable farms look to become more nutrient efficient one of the best ways of doing that is probably to is to get livestock on and 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 and, and utilize livestock in that system kind of look at a more kind of holistic mixed system 
And these are things that we're going to have to look at going forward. These are things that are going to have to um, become more and more common. And I think they are. And I think we're all doing what we can now. Um, but things are going to heat up. Things are going to get more uh, in the next, in the, in the future. Um, and a carbon footprint and understanding our emissions is going to become key to that. Next slide, please. So I'll just finish up here now. Um, but ultimately, I think what, what's coming from COP26 and what will come, the, 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 the event itself, the conference itself, isn't going to look at agriculture in any great detail. So it's going to focus on energy. It's going to focus on all these different things. I think in the goals for it, agriculture is only mentioned once under biodiversity and nature, which is, a, which is a shame. I really believe that, and I know others will believe that too. Um, but what will come from it is this increased scrutiny. Now, it's been increasing. Every, we all know that the scrutiny that agriculture has been receiving for its emissions has been increasing for the last five years anyway. That's not going to go away. What we need to do is get better at um, showing what we're doing because we're already doing an awful lot. We need to do more and then, then really show that. Policy is shifting. It's shifting towards these uh, multiple benefits, these kind of um, biodiversity, carbon related benefits. And that's going to have an impact on how we farm on a day to day basis. The last one there, I really wanted it to be increased opportunities because I do believe that there's a fantastic future in agriculture if we get on board, if we buy into these environmental um, the environmental side of things, reducing emissions, and really become a, a world leader in low carbon products, low carbon food. And whenever anyone questions our, our emissions, we have the answers and we say, well, this is why, this is why, and this is everything else that we do. And we, we, we build ourselves up to be really the, the, the greenest and the, 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 the world leader in climate change, mitigation, low carbon agriculture. Um, and that's what I wanted to finish on because a lot of it can seem a bit, a bit doom and gloom, but I think there's a fantastic future if we if we take take advantage of the opportunities and buy in to this this side of things, um, that's my slides finished. I'm going to try and run a poll here now before I climb or move over to Nigel. So this is just I just wanted to ask because of the kind of increased um, climate change and carbon um, agenda, I suppose. I wanted to know whether you felt, whether farmers felt as though your knowledge of climate change and climate issues has increased over the past few years. So I'm going to launch this poll now. And if, if you could let us know just what you um, what you think on that. So it'll just come up on your screen and you just it's just a yes or no vote to the question. So I'll leave that up for, uh, we'll say one minute. So you should be able to see that now, hopefully. Great. Well, I think that's everyone. I think everyone's nearly answered already. Um, but it's an overwhelming yes to that. So I think that just kind of proves the point, I suppose, that there's a um, an increase that we're 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 getting we're getting it. We're starting to get it, and we're going to start that agriculture as a, as a whole is going to um, hopefully take advantage of the opportunities um, that are coming our way in the future. So. I'll end that poll now and hand over to Nigel. Hi, um, thanks very much. And it's uh, good to be with you. Um, I, I guess that poll is quite frightening in a way because maybe you guys uh, out there, you know, know it all. So I hope, hopefully with the, the sort of presentations this evening, you will give you a new sort of dimension. And before I start, maybe I should just give a few your words about the, the uh, independent inquiry uh, for farming 1.5. Uh, there's been so many you know, reports and inquiries on climate change, and, and uh, I guess a lot of them are sitting on a shelf uh, uh, gathering dust. 
and maybe that's the destination for ours as well. But the independent inquiry is slightly different in that it's, uh, 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 it's involved a whole spread of people, you know, an economist, uh, 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 people from the environmental sector, NGOs, uh, climate change scientists, a geneticist, a forester, as well as farmers. So, so a, a real spectrum of society uh, uh, has been involved. And the idea was to try and build a consensus you know, across that group on recommendations. And it isn't just about climate change, it's about uh, food, and it's also about uh, uh, biodiversity and landscape in our communities. Because if we're gonna have a, a policy and we're gonna actually go into a period of change, we want to actually get to a positive place, a better place for us all. And food's gonna be part of it. And biodiversity is gonna be really on the agenda. And having a holistic policy makes sense. There's, there's real sort of synergy between biodiversity and sequestration, but it's also a fundamental to a sort of healthy environment for farmers and for food production. So bring this all together rather than having it fragmented, you know, makes perfect sense. So, so that, that's a wee bit of the background and, and uh, you know, much of what I say will, will, will be your result of that, that sort of inquiry and, and the recommendations that have been made in the reports. And this is what I hope to cover. Uh, uh, you know, I think that there'll be a bit of background stuff and maybe some will cross over what Seamus has said, but it's, it's also about uh, uh, um, you know, looking at why the pressure is building on agriculture and the challenges we face, because agriculture is in quite a strange place where, where there's quite a lot of factors impinging on it. And in some ways, the way you assess it is, is quite clumsy as well. So, so that, that, that's a real challenge for farmers. Looking at the baseline science, look at what change might look like, the sort of change we might adopt, and looking at the actual destination, what farming might look like in 2045 when we reach net zero, because it's absolutely vital that you have a pathway which is manageable and rational and actually delivers, and we all look at the milestones and think we can actually deliver them. But the destination's key. If we don't get to a sustainable business at the end of that, and we don't have a sustainable farming system, uh, or a system that we can actually buy into and, and have aspirations to, there's no driver to change. It's got to be a good destination. So, so hopefully we've got some options there which you know, fit with different farms, different systems, but also the aspirations of a whole range of farmers. And there's no two farmers the same, so that's quite important. Uh, and uh, lastly, looking at how we actually monitor that and quantify it, because that's quite complex and it's actually you know, something which is quite controversial as well. So let's just kick on. We haven't got too much time, 20 minutes. And this is really just reiterating what uh, Seamus had up. This is Scotland's emissions. And you can see there, Scotland uh, agriculture number three in the list. Uh, and the orange bar there shows where we've got to get to by uh, 2035. So that's a, a, another 30 odd percent or 35 percent reduction. And that doesn't sound too bad. But in the reality, in the last period, we only managed just over 15% reduction. And the way we did that in the last period was by having less livestock because, and also by using less nitrate fertilizer, possibly because of price pressure. Uh, and there haven't been you know, significant other changes. So, so that 35% target is a big one uh, and is, is actually going to be quite challenging. The other thing to note, I suppose, is uh, before we move on to this next slide, is that, uh, can we go back one, sorry, is that waste is quite a small one, but it's a methane producer. And in the last period, it's actually reduced its methane emissions by 75%. So that gives you an idea. And if you look at energy again, huge, huge uh, 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 improvements in, in renewable energy, you know, making that look quite good. So that's a, one of the reasons why agriculture looks as if it's lagging behind. And also, if we look at this table, the, the, the actual, it's not very tidy for farming because if we do, if we have woodlands or if we have wetlands or we have peatlands on our farm, it goes into that land use and land use change and trees uh, uh, inventory right at the top there. It doesn't go into that agricultural inventory at all. Uh, and and it, it's, it, it, it's invisible to the public. And if we do re generate renewable energy, it goes into the energy inventory. So agriculture as a business uh, contributes to more than one inventory. And the inventory for agriculture is all the crap, basically. It's, it's the, the emissions from cattle, the enteric emissions. It's the emissions from uh, nitrate and urea fertilizers, from manures. Uh, it's the carbon that bleeds from the soil when they cultivate. It, it's all the negatives that go in the agriculture inventory. And that makes it even more difficult. So we need to get a political agenda which actually accepts 
that we have that our profile is a compound of three inventories. Let, let's just kick on. And this is really looking at the challenges we face. Uh, and uh, the first big challenge is that Scotland can't get to net zero without agriculture attaining net zero. And it's also really important that agriculture manages the land in such a way that it uh, creates a sequestration bank because the land or sequestration is also going to be you know, a balancing sink for other activities which, which we can't balance or we can't mitigate against. So agriculture's got a huge role and that's one of the reasons we've got real pressure on us. Food, uh, the UK Climate Change Committee, and, and you know, some of you may have read that report, but its, it's uh, uh, principle is that we maintain food production per capita as we go forward so that uh, uh, we don't export our emissions to other countries to produce our food and import more food. Uh, and because of uh, population growth, that probably means something like a 20% increase in food production. So as well as having the pressures of climate change and, and uh, biodiversity, we've also got to be pretty smart and increase food production quite significantly. Nitrate fertilizers, right at the center of this, uh, you have a big, uh, I suppose, uh, powerful greenhouse gas, a 298 multiplier compared to carbon dioxide, but it can double uh, uh, you know, our production. And in a world where we need food, it's going to be very difficult to walk away from that. So, so you know, let's bear that in mind that nitrate fertilizer is, is, you know, is a double-edged sword. It's vital to us, but it's also quite a, a heavy emitter. And it's not just an arable issue. 50% of the nitrate fertilizer in Scotland is actually spread on grassland. So it, it's a headache for, for, for us all. Uh, agriculture, as we've seen, doesn't fit the, the inventory. So if you have a whole farm approach, you look at three inventories, not one. So, uh, and, and hopefully the government accepts that, but we've got to get a, a smarter way of presenting it to the public to make sure that they realize that the actual strides we're making. Uh, the next one is probably, we'll look at it in a bit more detail, is, is the actual metrics we use to measure uh, global warming potential of our gases. The, the one which is used and is enshrined in international agreements is GWP 100. That's global warming potential over 100 years. Uh, and that is, doesn't fit very well with methane. And we'll, we'll look at that in a wee bit later. And, and we can also look at sequestration. The methodology for that looks quite clumsy. It's not standardized. We don't really know what's going on a farm just now. We haven't got a good baseline. Uh, and uh, we don't really know what biodiversity and uh, uh, sequestration assets we have on Scottish farmland. And that's 83% 80, 80, of uh, land use in Scotland. So, so that, that's, that's a, a, a baseline that we really need to try and fill in. Let's, let's just kick on. And this is really looking at the gases that, uh, uh, and this is a UK bar chart, uh, and you can see the figures for Scotland above. In reality, Scotland produces a bit more methane and uses a, li a bit less uh, uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, and in, in very crude terms, you know, just under 60% of our emissions are methane, you know, something like 30% uh, are, are uh, 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 nitrous uh, uh, oxide and 10% uh, are carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide, the <clears throat> vast majority of that is fuel or energy from tractors, you know, uh, machinery, uh, from cooling uh, milk, from drying crops, and a very small amount is, is actually bleeding from the soil when we cultivate. So, so that, that, that's where we are just now. Let's, let's kick on. And um, this is methane. And uh, methane, as I say, is different from the other two gases. It's a short-term gas, and within 12 years, it's disappeared, uh, unlike the other two gases, which accumulate in the atmosphere for certainly well over 100 years. Uh, and this is uh, work done in Oxford by Alan and Kane and their group, uh, trying to factor that decay factor into a new metric. And this is looking at, uh, uh, I suppose, emissions over a 20 or 25 year period uh, and uh, uh, looking at how emissions uh, decay, uh, uh, balance up. And uh, what we're really looking at here is, is the uh, envelope of emissions from agriculture going into a notional envelope of uh, methane in the, in the atmosphere which agriculture has created. And you can see the left-hand column. If we actually keep increasing our emissions, really there isn't an awful lot of difference between GWP 100 and, uh, uh, and this new metric, GWP star. We get a lot of warming. You know, that's the reality. If we keep producing more methane, we're going to get more warming. If we actually reduce our uh, uh, methane emissions by 10%, roughly half a percent a year, 
you can see then that uh, under GWP star, we still have significant warming under that metric. Under GWP star, we don't have any, we're in balance. We're not creating new warming. And if you go to the right-hand bar charts, this is where we're actually reducing our emissions of enteric emissions or our methane emissions by 25%. And you can see there that you're actually getting to a stage that not only have you stabilized the, the warming impact of the, the agricultural envelope in the atmosphere, you've actually reduced it so that you actually get a, a notional cooling. So th this, is, this is a pretty significant uh, bit of work and it's accepted now by quite a lot of uh, the major bodies, including the UK Climate Change Committee. It's not enshrined in any international agreements or in, the, in inventory, and it's not used in inventories. But in reality, if ruminants are gonna have a future, that real science is probably gonna be part of the deal. Uh, to actually, you know, work under GWP-100 is going to be very, very difficult if you've got a significant uh, ruminant population. And we see countries like New Zealand are adopting this sort of approach, looking for a, a 25 to 50% reduction in enteric emissions by 2050 to actually ensure that they don't have any warming from their methane emissions under this, uh, this new metric. Okay, let's just kick on. So that's methane. And this is really looking at the opposite end. This is looking at sequestration. I know farmers are always really frustrated that that never gets taken into account enough except for trees and the first two in the column are broadleaf uh, uh, woodlands uh, either 100 year old and 30 year old and you can see there that the the soil uh, and the soil and vegetation actually uh, capture a lot of carbon and there's a flux there a negative flux that means that there's actually they're absorbing a wee bit of carbon every year look at hedgerows they're not quite so good, but they still have a negative flux and they're pretty significant. We've got plenty of those. If we go to the bottom, if we've got blanket bog, uh, and I suppose if you farm in Caithness or something, this is pretty relevant. They are extraordinary uh, efficient, uh, uh, I suppose, stores of carbon, you know, far greater than and more stable than woodlands are. And in the middle there, you can see the sort of agricultural uses, uh, I suppose, upland heath, which might be extensive grazings, uh, acid grassland, uh, hay meadows, all, all actually storing quite a lot of carbon. Uh, on, on the sort of heath and acid grassland, the view is that they're pretty stable. So there isn't much emissions and there isn't much flux uh, going on to uh, carbon being absorbed. Although we'll look at some figures later, which suggests there's a wee bit. You can see that hay meadows, they're actually uh, uh, absorbing quite a lot of carbon, but that will probably be released once the, the hay's eaten. So let's just crack on. And this is really just next slide looking at uh, fields uh, uh, under different management. And these are, you know, uh, uh, I suppose, looking at the grass phase. The, the uh, fields that have an R beside them are under rotation, sometimes a very long rotation. But you can see the first one on the list there is, is uh, just gone back into grass after several years in, in the whole crop and, and barley. And you can see the soil carbon there down at 3.1. Uh, and as you move down uh, through the list, you know, uh, uh, fields that should be in rotation, but have actually been back in grass for a bit longer, they've built up to 4.5, carbon. So that, you know, that, that's, that's quite an improvement. And just to confuse you, that right-hand column is percentage change, not flux. So a positive figure means that we're actually absorbing carbon rather than reverse. Sorry about that. Now, if we go right to the bottom, we're looking at fields that have been, you know, uh, and some are almost semi hill land, which have been in grass, or I suppose it's not grass, it's quite a, a biodiverse sward or, 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 or a grazing area. Uh, and uh, the bottom two showing quite high levels of, of uh, 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 you know, carbon, carbon store. Uh, and in one case, you know, a, a positive sort of accumulation as well. That PMN figure, you know, is, is uh, this is SAC. Uh, analysis, and this is uh, maybe discussed later, but this reflects the, the sort of uh, uh, microbial activity in the soil, which uh, translates uh, mineral nitrogen into a form that plants can absorb it. So you're looking for a target between 20 and 50, and if you get up to those targets, you've got a soil which is, is microbially active and pr can present nutrients to the roots. So that, that's quite important, and it's related pretty closely to soil carbon, and you can actually build it up by throwing on, on farmyard manure. So, so that gives a wee bit of background on what soils might look like. Let, let's just bash on. And this is really farming 1.5. And this is the sort of approach that we think you've got to take to get to net zero. Uh, and it's a whole farm approach. So we are looking at sequestration as well as the agricultural inventory, which is very much about emissions. And we're also thinking that renewable energy on farms is, is important uh, uh, as well. And we think 
we've got to look at, map our farms and quantify baseline because we think there's a lot of land on uh, 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 within our agricultural holdings and it varies very much from the type of holding where there's a significant sequestration asset whether it be hedges or whether it be acid grassland or whether it be wetland or woodlands or, or, or shelter belts, these all amount to something. They're not properly mapped. They should be, and they should be quantified. Soil carbon, really important. We don't see that as, as, as a way of actually absorbing carbon. We see it as more as a foundation for you know, efficient production uh, 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 and actually delivering nutrients efficiently and ensuring that you know, the fertilizers we use are actually you know, used efficiently, but also that it's a, it's a buffer against extreme climate events. And I think we've probably all experienced that, you know, soils that are in uh, better condition and tend to be more resilient, either in, in droughts or, or in extreme uh, uh, wet, wet times. And I guess you in the West are probably more concerned about uh, floods than, 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 than droughts. Um, reducing emissions, absolutely key. The more we reduce emissions, the less pressure there is on our culture, uh, to actually you know change land use so the, the 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 more we reduce emissions the more room there's for farm the more room there's for biodiversity uh and the more wiggle the room is for actually uh, uh um developing our systems in a positive way for food production so emission reduction is absolutely key and we are looking at two approaches and i know that at the moment you know there's quite a lot of talk about you know efficiencies and how we might do that uh, as a first phase but we think a, a, a second phase probably more uh, reliant on you know developing science is also necessary and probably doing that on a on a targeted basis that you actually have a what we're suggesting is a, a, a greenhouse gas reduction contract for each gas uh, uh, so those are two phases a mitigation menu and a green then followed by a greenhouse gas reduction and that first mitigation menu may be bringing down uh, emissions by 20 percent and i know the World Wildlife Fund have done a report which says you can do it by 30 or 35 percent. And Jim Walker has got a mitigation menu on steroids, which is at about that sort of level as well. And the Irish have uh, got one which says you can do about 30 percent. But both the WWF and uh, uh, the Irish cheat because they have a bit of woodland creation and uh, peat restoration, uh, which is land use change, put in their menu. So, so beware of these, these optimistic figures. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess the, at the bottom is a real bit of a hint of where we think we're going. I think there's going to be two options about how you do this. You're either going to be production focus, which is made very much precision farming uh, and probably high tech, but it's also going to actually be based on pretty um, traditional, uh, um, you know, uh, I suppose, cropping patterns as well, rotations and, and soil management and, and uh, green manures and using natural uh, farmyard manure when you have it, and maybe even having breaks where you have livestock grazing or lambs finishing are going to be part of the deal uh, to get your, your uh, nitrogen use efficiency up, but and also your soil carbon up, but also really high tech farming is going to be part of it as well. So that's precision farming. The second where we think is a nature value sort of farming, and this for some people would equate to organic farming. We, we, we haven't used that term, but the EU is looking at organic farming and going for 25% of the area being organic. Our nature value is very much more about uh, sequestration and uh, uh, biodiversity. So we're suggesting that these units should have 30% of their land contributing to sequestration. And that could be a whole mix of things, whether it be trees or whether it be wetland or whether it be uh, uh, you know, thin peat or acid grassland, you could have a mix or, or scrub or agroforestry. Uh, and also to biodiversity as well. So, so that, that, that's our, our, our skeleton plan. So let's, let's just move on. And this is really looking at a mitigation menu. Uh, and uh, this is work really done by uh, SAC a lot of it. And this is really just showing that some of these options in mitigation menus, uh, and as I say, there's quite a lot of them about, uh, you are, have a positive cost benefit. So if you go to the right-hand side, uh, you're having you know, clover and grass lays, it has a, has a slight cost benefit. Uh, improving beef genetics with a balanced breeding goals has a, a, a positive a cost benefit. Uh, improving plant genetics so you get better nitrogen use, a positive there as well as cattle health. If you go to a really fundamental one there, uh, putting legumes into rotations, there is a cost to that. But we're probably going to have to carry this cost. So you know, zero or net carbon farming isn't going to be necessarily low cost. Support's going to be important. And also extra support for actually investing in, in uh, change is going to be important in new infrastructure. 
let's just go to the next one. This is really uh, looking at where the next generation goes. These are the gases, carbon dioxide, not really talked about much, but you could get some early wins here because this is all about machinery and it's about throwing money at it. So if you actually invest enough and move to electric power and, and uh, hydrogen power in the next 15 or 20 years, and, and you targeted that on the, the high hours machinery or the high use machinery, you could get some pretty significant reductions there. And this is a long-term gas, so it might not have a big multiplier, but it could make a real difference. And we've got to do that sometime. We've got to actually put that infrastructure, in. we've got to make those changes. So we should start doing it pretty quickly. Nitrous oxide, 298 multiplier. We really want to build on, on the best practice, which we built up through the mitigation menu and other, other initiatives. Our nitrogen use efficiency at the moment is about 50%. We've got to get that better. Uh, and you can see there in the bottom half of the column, uh, the sort of things that will be in a contract for reducing nitrous oxide, a mandatory uh, uh, rotation with a nitrogen fixing phase. Uh, your plant genetics is going to have to change. We're going to have to use N inhibitors, you know, whether it be urease inhibitors or whatever, uh, for controlled release. And we've got to, to also look at raising our game on precision farming and, and probably even chlorophyll mapping. So we actually target our uh, uh, nutrients in the right way. And then we've got a nitrogen uh, uh, nature value system, which on certain areas will not be using any nitrogen at all. Uh, got a bash on, running out of time in here. This is methane, and this is probably exciting. And there's really a lot of exciting science going on. And in reality, it's a pretty important you have a dynamic process and keep feeding that science in because our, we're getting great understanding what we do, but also we're getting new new initiatives. And, and if we go to the contract, it's going to rely, rely pretty heavily on feed answers or bonuses. And you all have heard of the NOP. It can reduce uh, uh, um, you know, enteric emissions between 10 and 40%. That's going to be validated and it's going to be licensed. But if you put that bolus, you could, or you've got dairy cattle, you can probably, you'll get it there quite quickly. Genetics, balanced breeding goals can actually bring down your, your uh, uh, emissions. But the real uh, uh, game changer would be a climate change index. The reality is that enteric emissions are quite heritable. You have cattle which have you now produce less than 30 or 30% 30 less emissions than the average. Uh, and this is all about the rumen biome and uh, the genetics of the animal controls that. So if you actually have a, a good uh, emitting cow, a low emitter, and you actually change our, our rumen biome by taking out that, uh, 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 that, that material from the gut and repopulate it with a, with a new flora, the genetics of the animal will make it change back to the original, and she will continue to be a low, low emitter. So th this is something that we can actually breed for and build into a climate change index. Uh, and that, that has really exciting prospects as well, because it's cumulative. Uh, and we're looking for you know, that 30 to 50% reduction in, in uh, methane to actually uh, 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 you will be, be achieved by 2045. So let, let's let's pick on, uh, and we're getting there. This is uh, carbon footprinting, and we've all, this is probably SAC work for QMS, and we've all looked at this, and people like me and most farmers think, get our carbon footprint down, and everything's going to be absolutely wonderful. And one of the ways of doing it, if you're in the red meat sector, is actually getting your reproductive efficiency up and reducing your neonatal mortality. Because as soon as you get more lambs weaned or you get more calves weaned, your carbon footprint comes down. And you think, great, this is a win-win because it's economically positive. But the sod is that this is reducing your carbon footprint, but it's actually reducing your, to it's increasing your total emissions. Because instead of having you know, 100 cows and 80 calves running about, you've got 100 cows and 90 calves running about and being fed and, and uh, uh, requiring fodder. So you, 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 some of these carbon footprints are misleading. Uh, you've actually got to look deeper than that. And that's why probably the next slide, you know, actually looking at your business as a whole or your enterprise as a whole is going to get uh, even more important. This is a carbon calculators on the next slide. And uh, you know, there's a whole range of these. I think farmers have found them really difficult because they're, they're difficult to load all the data accurately. And they seem to be quite clumsy. And I think some farmers feel that they don't actually take account of all the factors they should do, but they are science-based and they are developing quite fast. And this is AgriCalc looking at one farm. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, you can see the first column. This is really just as is in 2019, it gives you the total emissions, the emissions of each gas. 
and in this case, uh, manually, they've actually inputted uh, you know, the woodlands and hedges, uh, and uh, there was no soil sequestration in, at that time, and you got a carbon footprint of uh, 20 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram. This is uh, looking at uh, um, the second column, is looking at uh, uh, the same data, but with the new agricult methodology, which takes into account soil sequestration. And soil sequestration in the, uh, the, the, the calculator very much uh, factors into the number of years that grass has been in place and builds that into, into a, a factoring in the level of carbon that you're storing. And you can see by just by that one change of this uh, soil sequestration, you've pulled down your, your carbon footprint by by three kilograms. So that, that's quite significant. Uh, and you know, if we measure our hedges and, and, uh, 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 and start looking at wetlands and uh, you know, other features on farm, we can actually you know, get, make sure that sequestration figure is, is actually more, more accurate. The, fi the, the, the final column is modeling, and it's really just to show you, you know, how if you, you know, if you had a really good calculator, you could feed in different management changes and options to see what it looks like. And this option that we've looked at is putting in 15 hectares more trees and reducing your cows by 10%, 15. And you can see there, this is on the old model, so it hasn't got any sequestration in it, but you can see there that what, it, what the impact it has, uh, not just on, on carbon footprint, but also if you look at the top on total emissions as well. And total emissions is going to be the real deal in the future. That's what we've got to figure on, that's what we're going to focus on, and that's what we've got to use to get to, to net zero. So I think I've gone over time. I'll leave it at that. And uh, hopefully there's one or two things there that uh, has made you angry and will uh, will uh, uh, spur a few questions. Thanks very much for your time. And I think we're over to Seamus. Yeah, I think Alex has been monitoring the questions there. So I'm sure there's a few come in. Yeah, some, some really great questions coming in. Uh, a couple of really good statements that we can just uh, run past uh, both of you. So yeah, really, really good. So we'll get kicked off, um, Seamus, with uh, the, the first question that came in here was from uh, from Gwen. Um, Gwen's um, asking, well, Gwen is saying that uh, every 0.1% uh, percent uh, increase in organic matter content in the soil is the equivalent of storing 8.9 tons of carbon dioxide. Is this taken into account anywhere? So uh, maybe a kind of general question about uh, the impact of, of soil uh, organic matter content and how that plays into things. Well, there's, there is so much research ongoing into soil carbon and the impact of soil carbon in reducing emissions and different kind of management that we can do to increase the amount of carbon dioxide that is taken into the soil. The, the science around it, I think, is still not 100% there. Uh, the, the IPCC have put out a, uh, a, a, an, an update in 2020 where they've looked at soil carbon. The, the issue with it is, I think, is that it's such a as, as you know, no farm is the same and you could have one field with different soil types and different kind of completely different um, soil properties and these kind of things. And all of those behave differently in the amount of carbon that's sequestered. And what these calculators are trying to do is to try and estimate soil carbon sequestered. And we as 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 scientists trying to trying to do this, we have to follow the the science that is um, taken by the IPCC and the the kind of peer reviewed um, report. So that that sounds like an awful lot, um, and it may well be be true in certain conditions, in certain um, certain types of management, certain climates, and these kind of things. Um, what we're what we try to do because we can't is, is, is kind of do a best es estimate um, for what we've got in Scotland and the different management principles. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, um, but it is taken into account anyway. It's soil carbon, and we're, we're trying to get better at it. You know, we're trying to get better, and the sciences can always advance in there. 
Yeah, I think you know Seamus has given you a pretty good uh, uh, answer. I think that second chart, looking at field different fields, rather emphasise that it's a bit unpredictable about you know how the how you know different fields, even that with the same soil type and same farm, respond in in ways which are quite surprising. So to get uh, um, you know manage the increase is actually quite difficult. But if you look at Hutton surveys, your know, soil carbons in Scotland are generally pretty good. Uh, and uh, I think there's probably well, you know, one of the recommendations of the 1.5 report was actually having a sort of mandatory uh, 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 you know, carbon testing of soils every uh, five years. So you actually had a, uh, a national inventory of, of soils in Scotland to actually underpin uh, uh, you know, the value of your soil carbon so you could prove to the IPCC or whatever what it was. Because I, I think that you know, the reality is that's one of the tools we have. We probably are quite good at it in Scotland without even trying, uh, and, and we've got to use it. So, and and you know, the, the one barrier to that is that your carbon analysis just now is quite expensive. Maybe technology will make it cheaper. In the meantime, maybe the government should actually you know put money into that to to make that sort of national survey possible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, just another comment here from Gwen that um, healthy um, grassland um, sequester CO2 is there a, a figure for grassland sequestration? I think we kind of covered that, but do either of you want to, to touch on that again? I think the, the, uh, the trouble with all sequestration figures is that the, there doesn't seem to be a standard methodology. So if, if you look through the papers, you know, it's always defined in different ways. Uh, and even you know, things like they take into account you know the vegetation and the soil and then they quote different soil depths for different you know different uh, 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 um, surveys uh, and uh, th there's no sort of period either that is uh, actually standardized and, and that gets even more alarming with with forestry where you go through very extreme phases of uh, both carbon sequestration but also carbon loss so uh, uh, yeah I, I, yeah we, we do have figures and and but but they're 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 questionable. I think you need you know some sort of standard system, and we haven't got one. Right. Um, another question here about carbon auditing um, data collection um, and how the the data collection from carbon audits and for the beef efficiency scheme participants, how that has been used and, and how that's going to be used. Um, any thoughts there, either of you? I think you know that data set really is quite important. I think, sadly, I think some of the the audits were were uh, uh, you know, the auditing system was difficult, and and actually inputting accurately is very difficult. So uh, at times, probably standard values were put in rather than the real farm data, and that that sort of tends to miss the validity of the whole exercise. But uh, but in in principle, it is actually a, a really good start. It's a really good baseline. Uh, I haven't seen the, the cumulative output of that, but with that uh, uh, carbon audit that you saw, that I felt one, the, the original one was done for, you know, for that scheme, like so. Uh, so that was fed into that scheme, and uh, I think it would give a, a pretty, you know, quite a good overview of, of uh, uh, you know, Scottish suckler cow systems. I think I, I just add that I think it, it as Nigel said there, um, it's it's a good place to start. I would say. To give as an overview, and as as we get better, as the, the footprinting tools get better, um, it'll become more useful going forward. I think um, so that's all I'd say there. I think you know, if in a perfect world, it'd be good if if uh, you know, the, the, these these uh, uh, carbon footprint tools could interface with the databases we have on on livestock numbers, so that they, they automatically generate the right or or automatically feed in the right numbers. And I think also, you know, if we actually mapped our, our, our uh, you know, our IACS maps are updated. At the moment, a lot of farms have got woodlands on them, which you are grant aided, so they're actually mapped. But old woodlands are just left gaps. There's no no figure to them. They're not measured. So if you if, if you're uh, uh, you're doing a, 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 an audit, you tend to pick up on the areas which are mapped, and you just aren't aren't aware of the ones which are gaps. So so you're updating mapping to actually put that in place. It's quite important. We don't have hedges on our maps either. We paid people to put them in, but we don't bother to put them on the IX maps. So, so the, the, the mapping would actually, again, start to feed better data into, into, into these calculators. 
I mean, thanks very much. Um, uh, just a comment really here from, from Angus. Um, Angus has worked uh, with uh, energy and, and buildings for, for 20 years in the construction industry. Um, just reiterating the point that you made um, earlier, Nigel, um, and Seamus, that, uh, that we need to get better at uh, PR in, in agriculture and getting across the messages of our, our different land uses. I um, don't know if either of you want to comment on that. The, the only thing I'd say there is I, I, I read that comment. Um, the, the, when we're reporting emissions and things like that, um, if we've got renewable energy on, on, our, on our farms, if we're feeding that into the grid, it, it goes into the, the overall grid um, kind of coefficient or, or um, footprint of energy. So the reason, so we've gotten very, very, um, we've reduced our emissions from energy use in the UK as a whole. And that has been due to all of the renewables that have been coming in and joining the grid. So if you have a, um, a renewable energy system and it is not part of the grid and just feeds your, your farm, your area, then that, then you will, and, and it, it covers you totally, then you will be, ultimately your energy use would be um, at zero emissions. But if it feeds into the grid, then it, it must be taken into the grid emissions for first for reporting to government and things like that. So it's it's one of these things that um again we need to try and try and get that across the government and say, well, well, we're a lot of farms have these renewable systems and are feeding them into um feeding into the grid and reducing the the, the total uh, emissions from energy in the UK. But that's not really being appreciated at the moment, and, and this is the reason why is because we 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 can't use that um, when we're doing carbon footprints for farms. We have to use the um, the standard figures that governments provide. That's yeah, I, th I think there's, there's a, a, you know, on the chat there. There's a, you know, a good point made about you know being essential food producers rather than livestock and animal farmers, and you know, it's it's a matter of. Mm -hmm presenting industry in, in in a rather different way so that you are become a vital you know spoke in 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 the world rather than you know just just a, 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 just another industry we're, we're actually fundamental to life uh, but I think that the other area that you know that on the original question about you know PR you know yeah we, we've got to get better at it and I think we've got to you know look at our allies uh, and realize you know some of the amazing assets that we have. Uh, you know, probably our biggest you know, uh, assets or, or allies are going to be, you know, the, the environmental groups and, and, and uh, uh, you know, organisations like your know, WWF and RSPB. Uh, they, they see real, real value in, in the sort of matrix of land use that agriculture provides uh, and the landscape values uh, and, and the biodiversity values. And if you look at, you know, things like low intensity grazings, which the EU are actually going to support in the future, they're highly biodiverse. Uh, but if they're on acid soils or thin peat, if you actually put trees on them, they, they probably perform more poorly as a sequestration asset than they do in their present form. So we've got to get that across. And I think these NGOs are really keen to actually you know, make that point that we've got to put trees in the right places. And a lot of the land in Scotland is better used for agriculture than it is for, for actually tree planting if you really want to store carbon. Uh, uh, so, so I think that, that there are allies out there which who you know, value what we do. And um, at times we don't recognize you know, some of the value we create. Brilliant, um, thanks very much. Um, a comment here from, from Stephen, um, who's, who's just saying that uh, it, it's a bit worrying if, if this, mitigation uh, menu that, that has been put together um, is going to be imposed without consideration of what farmers have done in previous years before any kind of baselining can be done. Um, any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a mitigation menu will be, you know, it is usually framed so that if you've already done it, you, you, you've ticked the box and you won't have to do it again. And I suppose a good example would be low emission slurry spreading. So if you've actually moved from a splash plate spreader to a trailing shoe or injection, you're not going to have to go and buy a new injector or a new trailing shoe. You've done it. So you've ticked the box. So, you, so you've got to pass for free. You know, because you've already done it. So those that are uh, early adopters, and if you've already got a rotation in place, or you're already you know, uh, uh, putting in break crops, 
uh, you know, you've done it, so you, you tick the box. Uh, but the, the real thing about, uh, uh, I suppose, climate change or, or uh, uh, reducing emissions is that everybody's got to do something. It's no good if you have you know, 10 or 20 percent of farmers doing wonderful things and the other 80 percent doing pretty much what they've always done. Everybody's got to actually contribute to this. Uh, and and that, that's the real driver behind the mitigation menu. It's actually pushing everybody in the same direction, making sure everybody contributes, pulling down things which are relevant to them and they can actually deliver on. So there's choice there, but also maybe having a sort of escalator. So you start off with two or three options you've got to do. And then as time goes on, you've got to do six or seven options. So you're, you're, you're actually moving the whole industry forward. And it is going to be mandatory. The idea is it's from the, our inquiries point of view, it is mandatory to actually get everyone to do it. And the exceptions for grassland farms like mine are going to go and we're going to have to do something as well. You know, so, so it's, it's all going to be bad news for farmers, basically. But, but it's, it's pushing things in the right direction. In the end, you know, it's absolutely vital. We, we can become really, you know, I suppose, a flagship industry you know, as far as low carbon food production, but also, you know, I suppose, the, the, the pillar of low carbon uh, uh, management for the whole of Scotland. Uh, uh, for the nation, so uh, so I think we, 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 it is an exciting future, but it, but it's uh, um, you know it's a tough road. There's no doubt. It's, 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 it, this isn't this isn't easy. Brilliant. Uh, another question here, um, Nigel from uh, from Stephen. He's asking whether or not we should really be including renewables in farm cal uh, calculations. Um, surely they they should come under um, industrial. Th thoughts on that. Well, they do at the moment. So we, 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 you know, when it goes into the, you know, the national inventories, we lose it. Um, my own view is that um, you know, in a whole farm system, uh, there should be an audit of what we're doing on farm, the whole business is doing. Because if you actually pull it down into a very narrow band, a lot of the activity that our managers, uh, I suppose, aspirations are, are locked out of the equation. And I think that's wrong. And uh, we haven't done it yet. On many farms, but in the future, the the uh, I suppose the, the 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 real goal would be to actually either collaboratively with your neighbours, or if you're a big producer on your own, actually try and generate the energy you use, so that uh, you know you, you can actually plug in to your own uh, uh, your renewable electricity for your telehandler or for your ATV. Or, or if you're a big producer or you have a collaboration, you could actually produce nitrous, uh, uh, produce hydrogen to have uh, hydrogen power tractors and heavy heavy equipment, which look as if that will that'll be the 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 the, uh, um, the mode of power. And you know, you know, hydrogen can be you know, produced from renewable electri electricity through electrolysis. So so th this this would be you know, a virtuous circle. So I think it's and, and, uh, I suppose at the moment my view would be that. You know, uh, government's got to incentivize that sort of investment, so there is that infrastructure and farm which makes these smart sort of uh, 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 energy efficient uh, uh, um, processes uh, possible. Next question here, folks. Um, if uh, if agricultural figures on on climate change only really show emissions, and, and if we're constantly competing with other sectors. Um, how can we how can we make the argument that we're locking more carbon into to soils and, and where can we make the argument for for biodiversity um, benefits and, and how do we ever get to, to net zero uh, I suppose uh, are, are you too optimistic about getting to, to net zero for the industry well it's, I think it's not a matter of optimism it's a matter of uh, uh, you know it's going to be essential we can't get out of this you know the the the, the, the this country and, and other countries have signed up to binding agreements that that's where they're going. And whether you think it's right or wrong, that's where we're going. Uh, and the UK government and probably the Scottish government even more so are determined to actually deliver on that. So, you know, we haven't got a choice, but what we do have a choice about is, is actually how we do it. And also I think there is a, and I don't think the Scottish government recognise it, that the inventory, the way it's actually, uh, um, built up just now the various inventories you actually give agriculture or agricultural businesses a pretty you know raw deal uh, and therefore you've got to compound those three inventories to actually get a true picture of agricultural activity 
uh, and that that's perfectly possible to do. Uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, political will to do it and to present it as as a compound rather than as a single uh, inventory. Uh, and and you know, without without that sort of flexibility, you're not going to get to net zero. I don't think you know that there are fundamental emissions there that we're, sure we're going to find very difficult to eradicate completely. Yeah, I think there just to reiterate what Nigel said, I think there needs to be a shift in the, in the way that it's it's looked at from a government level for uh, for it to be achieved really, um, and that comes down to the accounting of farm woodlands and these kind of things that the farmers are doing that are currently going into these other um, other packets. That are, it, there needs to be a shift there. And you know, you know the, the positive is that the calculators are already. You're know, looking at uh, 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 all all of those three components and, and building them into the the, uh, the carbon assessment of a, of a business uh, or an enterprise, and uh, you know that's what it's got to be because uh, without that, managers haven't got a way forward. How um, how does uh, no? I assume Jill, uh, when this question came in, I think Nigel, you were discussing um, soil carbon sequestration, so. Um, how does uh, soil carbon sequestration change uh, with uh, management practices like uh, no-till, regenerative grazing, um, and, and how does that complement uh, understanding active soil? I think um, you know there's some things that we you know we can definitely say are, are positive for, for soil carbons and uh, and, and uh, uh, you know incorporating you know, uh, your green manure, putting in farmyard manures and compost. These things all, you know, improve uh, um, you know soil carbons as do, does uh, you know grazing animals on on break crops. Uh, that that improves it as well. When you get to min till, uh, you know some of the figures look pretty impressive, but this is again uh, you know becomes complex because different uh, uh, authors have looked at different depths of soil, and if you look at the the top, you know, four inches of soil. Uh, I'm not sure how old I am, we're talking about inches. Uh, um, mint till looks of it performs really well, and ploughing looks of it's it's a real failure. If you start actually going down, you know, nine or ten inches, then in looking at the the, the soil carbon in that horizon, ploughing looks a hell of a lot better. So uh, I think the the the, the mint till does have positives without a doubt, and it certainly reduces the amount of energy you use to pre pre uh, prepare your seed bed. But I don't think it's black and white. I think there probably is a role for for deep cultivation ploughing as well uh, in certain soils. So, uh, 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 so you know, it is more complicated. Regenerative grazing it looks quite hopeful, uh, but again, you're looking at figures. Uh, uh, you know, you look at different soil depths, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think there's more data. Uh, you know, to, to look at these mob grazing systems and, and also to, to work through, you know, if you're wasting half of your grass and trampling it in, you know, is, is, is your system, you know, less sustainable? You know, in production terms, if you're actually looking for, uh, uh, in national terms, you know, 10% more food production from our, from our land mass or even more than that. So, uh, and that, that's one of the tensions between uh, um, organic farming uh, and, 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 and reaching the goals. Organic farming has a lot of positives and you, you're not using any nitrate fertilizer, so that's a real bonus. But can you actually deliver 10 or 20% more food than we do now with organic farming? Probably not, or almost certainly not, unless we, we come up with a new revolutionary idea uh, or, or new revolutionary, I suppose if you came up with cereals that uh, with genetic modification that, that uh, fix nitrogen or something, maybe you could. I don't know, but if probably organic uh, sector would reject that technology anyway. So uh, yeah, I, I think we've, we've got tensions there which are, are difficult to to, uh, to balance. I think just to, just to add there as well, I think it is fairly, um, anecdotally anyway, from my experience, regenerative systems seem to be doing a lot more for biodiversity than, than the conventional systems. Uh, that's my anecdotal experience. I've, now, I've not um, read into the biodiversity side of these systems too much, but how we measure that or how we kind of equate that or quantify the, the biodiversity benefit of regenerative agriculture, again, is something that we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to look at 
but it's um it it's it's just one of these another thing that needs to be looked at and i think the science is hopefully going to catch up uh with the calculators and stuff in the future yeah, I see on the chat there that, uh, uh, you know, about regenerative systems, I, I would agree with that, that we've got to learn more and it certainly has a role. Uh, and, and I think it may well have a you know, fundamental uh, uh, um, impact on the way we do things. Some regenerative practices which are, are uh, um, you know, are sort of held up as new, really hark back to what the Victorians did. So, you know, and I think that that's what we, we tend to forget is that you know what what we're reinventing now, uh, as far as soil management and, and uh, I suppose uh, building up soil fertility or nutrients are the sort of things that uh, you know we were doing 150 years ago and and and, and regarded as conventional agriculture. Remembering the the traditions that we forgot about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of similar sounding questions here, um, so I'll, I'll maybe just amalgamate them if that's okay. Um, but uh, do you see any scope for, for gene editing to, to accelerate genetic improvement within uh, ruminants? And uh, could companies potentially see that as, uh, as huge profit potential? Is that that's something that we should be looking at? Um, I think gene editing, you know, has got a role both in, in uh, uh, certainly in, in crop development, uh, whether it's necessary in, in, uh, in you know, animal breeding, uh, I think that probably the, the you know, it, it would speed the process, without a doubt, it would speed the process. But I think there, there are barriers as far as uh, uh, ethical barriers, which you know, may well block it just as uh, uh, GM has been blocked in many ways. Uh, it's a matter of, I suppose, um, I suppose recalibrating society's view of genetics and and, and uh, you know the value of gene editing, which is really a way of uh, I suppose facilitating the same process as natural selection, but doing it in a far more targeted way. Uh, and and if, if society can accept that, then I think it does open up uh, you know a, a more targeted approach to breeding, uh, which would give you you know, quicker, quicker uh, uh, impacts and, and positive results. But I guess that whenever you do that, you almost need some sort of ethical body to actually ensure that the breeding goals, which are actually pursued are, are, uh, are, are acceptable and, and are ethically acceptable. And I, I guess as well that the, the IP or the, the uh, processes should actually be publicly owned or, or owned by society, not by a commercial entity because a lot of the, the uh, issues around GM was the commercialization and also the fact that some of the, the actual GM modifications look unethical. So you've actually got to block block that out if, 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 uh, if gene editing is going to have a significant role. Okay, doke. Um, I'm going to, going to reward this slightly, but um... What what do you think that, that COP26 is going to deliver um, in, in terms of outcomes? What, what would you like to see from, from this? If, if Paris gave us the direction of travel, what, what would you like to see come out of, of COP26? I'll, I'll let Seamus uh, uh, answer that because I think it, it's, it's pretty high level politics. And I guess in some ways it's got to be a balance between the, the uh, you know, the planetary uh, um, essential goals, but also the actual uh, needs of, of local communities. And when I say that, you know, that, that particularly um, impacts on, on developing countries where, you know, you know some societies are, are, are maybe going to be put under extraordinary pressure. So I think that there's got to be some way of, of balancing those, those, those two, two uh, uh, imperatives. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's necessary um, because of the level of urgency and where, where we're at. We need to begin to act. And I understand that Paris uh, kind of set the pathway and kind of put us on the right route. But uh, ultimately, I think getting these people in a room together, getting all these influential um, politicians and policymakers in a room to try and get something that will work. And, and it's going to be it's going to be really difficult to do that um the way the world is at the moment um and 
the way China is and America and these kind of things to get these people to agree on a policy that or a, a, a something to move forward where um, it, may, it might hamper um, some of these other countries development um, is going to be difficult, but we need to try. And I think that the, the actual the, the impact of flying over here and the kind of emissions that uh, you, you kind of have to balance it and say, well, is it worth it? You could argue that it should be an online conference. You, you could argue that and say that the emissions would be, would be less. But um, I think that ultimately, ultimately, it's, it's, it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile to do it. Yeah, I, I see from the chat that we're, we're getting a kicking for not being more positive about regenerating, regenerative systems. Um, you know, the 1.5 did, did actually do farm visits and looked at regenerative systems, and we're actually pretty positive about them and supportive. But if you actually look at the data, it's actually quite difficult to get really solid data, which uh, uh, would, would allow you to, to say that certain processes should be, become you know, mainstream. Uh, and I say some of the processes which uh, regenerative uh, uh, enthusiasts or, or uh, practitioners um, adopt uh, are, are actually practices which are adopted in the mainstream sector. Or, or have been in the past adopted or used in the mainstream sector. They're not totally new. So, you know, uh, you know it's a bit like Mintil. You know, Mintil you know, has an amazing headline. It's quite easy to come up with a, with a, a, a recommendation that we should move completely to Mintil, but you actually want to look at the actual data which looks at different soil horizons to see the impact before you actually, you know, uh, uh, you know go to, to a 100% uh, support of, of any one one uh, system like or or or, or uh, technique and really that the, this has to be you know more more uh, research and more quantum uh, you know, more quantifiable evidence to actually underpin uh, you know, adopting you know these the, the these system changes and system changes will happen I don't doubt and that's why I said at the beginning you know we've actually got to look at this in an evolving way that uh, 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 um, that we do as we get more information, we adopt it and build it into our future plans. Because where we are just now, we don't know it all. That's reality. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious, folks, that uh, a lot more folk are using the chat. But we've got one last question in the Q and A there, and then we'll try and catch up with some of the chat questions. Um, can either of you see a, a, car a carbon border tax uh, being implemented to, to stop offshoring? Um, the work that, that we do um, at cost? Um, I think probably the, the main priority, you know, from my perspective and certainly the group's perspective is actually stopping carbon trading uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we don't actually sell our sequestration assets, you know, to, you know, out with the UK or out with Scotland uh, and then perhaps to to, to balance the emissions of, of corporations based on other, other, other countries. In reality, it looks as if the sequestration assets that we have on farms, if you're interested in active farming, should remain there to balance the farming activity. So, so we think that's quite important. Uh, and, and even if that isn't required for that, uh, it should probably stay in Scotland to balance economic activity in Scotland. If you trade at all, uh, you're actually going to become a, a an offsetting economy with communities which are sterilized and, and, and the landscape, which is a probably a monoculture of trees. So, so there's real dangers in a free market. And, and uh, so and, and that's something that's not happening already. We're seeing you know, whole farms being sold for uh, offsetting purposes, uh, you know, not just you know, all, all over Scotland that's happened. So, and, and there's a real danger to the tenanted sector as well, uh, if, if that sort of uh, uh, mindset you know, starts to to uh, to be accepted. Okay, um, another um, comment here from 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 Gwen. Um, she's making the point that um, you know, surely no woodland um, is is the same as another. Um, I think we were talking about um, soil a little bit earlier on and commenting on the the diversity of the soil. Um, I think she's just making the, the comment that uh, every woodland is different and. Uh, are we, are we confident uh, when we're calculating carbon sequestration that we can be accurate? Well, I think I mean, 
So I think that's your fundamental point. It's a good point. Uh, and and uh, it's very much the case that, that, that woodlands vary a lot. And, and uh, you know, if you look at Sitka spruce, it maybe has a, a cropping cycle of 50 years. For the first uh, uh, five or six years or seven years, you know, the, the planting sites probably bleed carbon. As the, the understory dies because of dense planting, you bleed more carbon. Uh, then you go through a phase where it builds carbon or absorbs carbon very quickly. And then when you have a clear fell, you again bleed carbon you know, from the soil and, and, and uh, you know, probably quite a component of the tree gets uh, burnt or chipped. So, so that you, you, over this cycle, you, you have very different phases. So you need to have a system of the whole life cycle to actually assess that. If you looked at uh, you know, low density sort of uh, broadleaf woodlands that are there for 100 years or more, that profile will be certainly very different. And if you look at agroforestry, where you might want to graze uh, between the trees and you use a, a, a very light canopy so that the understory never gets destroyed, then you have some sort of uh, 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 you know, grass or herbs on, on covering the soil all the time, uh, that profile would be very different. Uh, and it would probably be a, a, a more stable uh, uh, asset as far as sequestration goes. So yeah, there's a whole range there. And at the moment, our systems don't do that. We look at snapshots and we, we use snapshots to guide our, our land use. And that's a real danger. So I think we've got to get a lot smarter about how we define you know, the value of our, our plantings and also the way we manage them and design them because we could actually make them uh, you know, more dual purpose uh, and, and also deliver probably better for biodiversity. Yeah, I think just to, just to add to that, it's it, it's it's right that it's um, that it's all going to be different, and different different tree species have different will will sequester different amounts of carbon. But we we use the best the best available science right now to estimate that. And and as Nigel said, there we we probably need to start looking at for precision. We we'll look at precision um, kind of carbon footprints where we we'll look at individual individual woodlands and, and see what is there. But ultimately as well, as a woodland gets older, it, it stops sequestering carbon. It reaches a, a, a balance with the atmosphere and it, it stops taking in more. So it's these younger woodlands that are the ones that will have an impact on the carbon footprint side of things. Um, Great, no, no, that's good, that's good. Um, another question here from, from Ian. Um, just commenting on that, uh, whilst the farming industry has, has made great improvements, um, is our, our biggest challenge um, not educating um, and helping um, people who are outside of the industry to understand what it is that, uh, that we're doing? Um, perhaps we should uh, reference farmers as essential food producers uh, rather than, uh, than livestock or arable farmers. I, I'd agree with that. I think that's a good, that's a, it's a, it's a big part of it, but I, I do think that um, it, 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 it's not, we still have to do our, our bit, we still have to reduce our emissions and, and, and then I think once when we start doing that, get better at putting ourselves out there um, and promoting that work that we are doing and that's where the education comes in for the, for the general public. But I would also think that I, I think there's a bit of a disconnect even in, within, within farming as to the, the the, where the what happens to food once it once it leaves farm or how it's produced into that's what I feel is um is also an element of this that it's not just a, an education for for um we we'll say people in cities it's an education for absolutely everyone on on uh, what on farming and how we can reduce emissions and increase sequestration in agriculture. That's grand, grand. Um, a lot of comments coming in here and um, just advocating for, for uh, more trees, shrubs and um, perennials and, and uh, a lot of comments on, on soil. Um, so that's great. Um, regenerative agriculture um, is highly carbon capturing. Um, I don't know if you, you we've maybe touched on that. Um, Stephen, uh, again, making, uh, making some, some uh, comments on the use of AD plants um, and uh, methane emissions and total tons of ammonium nitrate. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, could, could you maybe just just um, comment on the, the use of AD plants um, for uh, for food stocks in comparison to output, and and how is that measured um, in terms of farming and, and energy production? Um, from my experience with AD is uh, we. I think the question is around um, fertilizer kind of use and reducing fertilizer use by increasing our use of AD. Um, and I think that around that, from what I found is it's quite difficult to um, get the levels of uh, nitrogen that's required to um, offset the kind of the fertilizer, um, the, the, the uh, inorganic fertilizer it, there's a high energy demand to do that and i think it doesn't really just now because the, obviously technology is continually improving but it doesn't actually um it doesn't wash its face so uh, yet but i i think that um it's definitely it's definitely going to reduce the amount of uh, inorganic fertilizer that's required. So it's it, again, it's one of the, another tool in our arsenal when we're when we're fighting climate change. Yeah, I think it's a tool, but I think it's you know as Seamus says, there are significant costs to to actually delivering the feedstock, uh, which take the shine off it a bit. Uh, and I guess the the reality is that probably if if you could use waste products in in the in the AD plant. Uh, or, and, and even use slurries as well, you know, it becomes a lot more attractive in, in, in its environmental impact. But uh, the, the negative to that is it becomes a lot less efficient as, a, as a, 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 an energy producer or a gas producer. So uh, um, you know, the, 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 there's a real trade-off there. Uh, but I think in Germany, they, they, they certainly, you, know, you have probably got smaller uh, uh, um, units which you know, handle a more diverse feedstock and maybe use waste, uh, you know, that, that maybe, you know, gives you a, a more positive equation. That's grand. There's another question um, here coming in from, from Gwen. Um, she's asking whether or not um, payments um, could be made to farmers growing their own protein fodder um, to feed on farm uh, as opposed to, to, to buying in purchased feeds um, as a way of, of producing input. I suppose my own view is that they should be uh, uh, incentivized to do that, and, and I think that you know there's you know good you know societal or or, or uh, 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 you know benefits in actually avoiding the import of of, uh, uh, of proteins like soya, uh, and the reality is if we actually create that use in that market, then uh, uh, having uh, uh, you know, viable rotations become a lot easier on many farms. So I think that, that, that is, is a, a, one of the key areas that we've got to change our mindset and our cropping uh, uh, um, profiles is actually getting a, a, a crops which fit with, uh, uh, you know, I suppose, human uses, but also make sure that we, we develop crops which underpin our need for protein on, on, on farm. Uh, and and uh, you know we, we haven't done that yet. That's for sure. Okay, dog. I, I can see that there, there's a couple of, of queries here from from Jill and Judith about regenerative agriculture. Is this something that you guys want to to touch on again? I think I just say that I, I think we both myself and Nigel agree that there's definitely a a, a future in regenerative agriculture. That with it's 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 a part again. It's another tool in the toolkit. That we that we'll need to use. Um, it's not something that uh, that I I have looked at in in much detail. Um, but I think that it's it's definitely a future. It's something for that we need to bring forward and possibly later on in some of our um, other webinars. This is the first of a series of five. We can bring in someone and have uh, someone that can speak a bit more about it. Um, that can answer some more of the questions. Uh, on regenerative agriculture. Great, great. Um, some nice comments from uh, from Ian coming in here just to say that Nigel, he totally agrees with you um, on scientific gain and ethics, um, and uh, just wants to to make the point that uh, it's not easy um, being the the messenger for for these uh, these kind of topics, and uh, appreciates both of your time. So that's that's really nice. Thank you. 